Here I am. Finally, we are all here. Thank you. Um, we've got still a lot more people in the in the waiting room, but we're going to begin in the interest of keeping on time. Um, my name is Ken Lusbader. I'm one of the co-directors of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. Um, we're here tonight with Eric Marcus, uh, Ann Northrup, and Eric Sawyer. Eric, uh, Eric Marcus is um, the founder, a historian of Making Gay History, which was a book and now a podcast. Um, Anne is a longtime activist, agitator, uh, host of Gay USA, and can contextualize the long history of ACT UP. And Eric, the same, is an activist and social um, um, progressive person who was a founder, uh, at, founding member of ACT UP, and at that first demonstration. So I'm um, going to leave it at that and go to the next screen, which basically excuse me for a second, as a project, uh, the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project looks at sites related to LGBT history from the 17th century to the year 2000. Um, and we have various themes because our map has over 330 sites. You can enter it and look at it that way. Um, but the reason we care about places is because the, we can embed them with this LGBT past. So this, for example, is where Larry Kramer was living when he founded GMHC in his living room. It's where he was living when he formed uh, ACT UP in 1987 with a speech that took place at, well, here's Larry Kramer, who was also the home of Edie Windsor there. Um, the center was the location where ACT UP was formed in March 10th of 1987. And this is the location of the first demonstration. And you can see this photo on the right. And Eric, is that you on the ground there? Because it sort of looks like you, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure. And there was no real caption in the Times. It may actually be, I, I can't quite tell for yeah. sure. But the point is with these images and sites, um, as place-based historians, we feel it's really important to look at sites throughout the city that create a cultural landscape of LGBT history. And as such, it's a way to teach and educate uh, about the past using buildings and resources as examples. So I'm gonna leave it at that and thank you for coming and toss it over to Eric Marcus, who's gonna be the host tonight and we're going to have an informal conversation with Ann and Eric Sawyer. Yeah, and Ken, you're not going anywhere because you'll be asking questions too. Correct. Um, so Ken and I already discussed beforehand that we would be interrupting each other and interrupting Ann and Eric. So we apologize in advance, um, but have lots of questions. So um, just for the purposes of full disclosure, Ann and I are both Vassar graduates and we co-founded the Vassar uh, Lesbian Gay Alumni, uh, it was actually called Lesbian Gay Alumni of Vassar College. So we have been um, troublemakers in arms for a long time. So Anne and Eric, um, where were you in February of 1987 in your lives? Um, Anne, this is a month before the founding of ACT UP. So Anne, why don't we start with you? Uh, I was still working at the CBS Morning News as a writer producer. I, but that was around the time I was about to quit and uh, throw myself out into the vast void and end up uh, going to work in the LGBT community at the Hetrick Martin Institute as an AIDS educator and educator on homosexuality. I didn't find ACT UP until the very beginning of 88, so I missed this first demo. But, but Anne, um, from C most people don't make that transition from CBS News to the Hetrick Martin Institute to teach about human sexuality and AIDS. Too I bad. Wonder... <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that too. Um, Ann and I also both, I like to follow Ann and uh, I followed Ann to Vassar and then to Good Morning America and the CBS News. That's um, his way of saying he's 10 years younger. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, but still not young Ann. Um, used to be, but not anymore. Um, so that transition, what was that transition like for you to go from CBS to HMI? That's a from a, a corporate environment to a, a grassroots new organization? New uh, that, that could be a long conversation, but the fact is it was uh, an enormous gift to me. Uh, I found out that it was, uh, first of all, much, much, much more fun and fun and satisfying to work uh, 
at a social service agency than in corporate America, believe it or not. And I also found in making the transition, I had been out at uh, CBS. I'd been out for you know, since 1976, out in, at Good Morning America, out at CBS. And when I went to work at Hetrick Martin, I found out very quickly that the change was that I was now being celebrated, not in spite of who I was, mm -hmm. but because of who I was. And it transformed my life. It transformed my sense of self-esteem. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. So Eric, where were you in your life in, in uh, February of 1987? Um, I, had, I was working at the time at a management consulting firm um, and was really good friends with, with Larry Kramer and had in July of 86 lost my uh, partner, Scott Bernard uh, to AIDS. And um, I had uh, you know been close to Larry since 1980 when I first moved here and I called him um, and to let him know that Scott had passed. Uh, and uh, he actually, I guess it was actually in, that he was going to uh, replace Laura uh, Nefron at the um, writer's speech at the LGBT community. And that his purpose uh, was to issue a rallying call to try to get people to uh, you know, turn out and start civil disobedience. He had been, as you know, really frustrated when he started GMHC because he wanted that organization to be political as well as a, a service provider. I mean, he was more interested in it being political, uh, but was you know, basically kind of driven out uh, because of his uh, loud mouth and uh, his refusal to be quiet and polite uh, and for confronting the mayor and the, the federal and he government. Could be, and, and, and he could be a little difficult too. It yeah, wasn't yeah, just, yeah. it wasn't just, uh, um, I mean, Larry, Larry uh, uh, and I say this in the most loving way possible, he could be a real pain in the ass and he made a lot of people um, uncomfortable, to say the least. Yeah, um, yeah, he, he did. And I uh, was also renovating a brownstone in Harlem and uh, when I was telling Larry about Scott dying, I said, you know, uh, I'm renovating these buildings. I, uh, you know, have that skill and I've learned about all the homeless people that are living with AIDS. I'd like to um, start de developing some AIDS housing. And he said, well, you come to this speech, uh, I'll introduce you uh, to the only person who was uh, then at Bailey House uh, trying to develop AIDS housing. Mm -hmm. It was called AIDS Resources Center, uh, I think at that time. Uh, and, and maybe you can work together to develop housing, but I really wanna form this civil disobedience organization. So if you can come bring some of your uh, friends from Fire Island, uh, you know, when I call for people to join me in doing a civil disobedience action, you know, stand up and volunteer to help uh, and, and see if you can, you know, pre-convince other people to do the same. Uh, and I did and stood up with a number of my friends uh, and uh, agreed to um, go to uh, the, the, the very first planning meetings were held in Larry's apartment uh, where the, that action that you saw was planned. And were, was the meeting at the center, you know, what, publicized for Larry? I mean, because it was a Nora Ephron a moment was he, right. he was generating publicity through people like yourself. So he knew it was gonna be a fiery speech. And yes. He, mm -hmm. And, and uh, he literally was soliciting plants, uh, you know, calling all of his friends like Roger McFarland and Tim Sweeney and, you know, mm -hmm. others uh, in the movement mm -hmm. uh, who were all in on, uh, you know, the call to arms and, uh, you know, a number of us, uh, you know, were, you know, had kind of, pre uh, agreed to, you know, contribute varying thoughts to, you know, how this, this action could be uh, pulled off. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, it was very dramatic. You know, he started uh, it, it very early on. Uh, he said, okay, I want everyone on this side of the room to stand up. Uh, and, and he said, 
with you know within the next few years 50 percent of you are going to be dead so everybody sitting is dead the rest of you are here uh and and you know just as a as a way and and you know when he said that deep pause of silence and everybody just kind of like looked at each other like what the fuck uh so it, Eric, it was, did, uh, did, at that very point impactful. Or- did you have a um, have a, a past experience doing um, activism uh, of that kind, or is this new for you? It was relatively new for me. Uh, I came out when I was in grad school in uh, Boulder, Colorado, at CU, uh, and was involved somewhat with uh, uh, LGBT group that, oddly enough, was uh, started by Tim Gill of the Gill Foundation. Uh, and you know, was doing some public speaking uh, on what it's like to, you know, live an alternative lifestyle. Uh, and we we crashed the um, straight dances at the, uh, you know, the the public uh, community center uh, at at CU, uh, and got you know kind of chased out by uh, the cowboys uh, for you know dancing with people of the same sex. But that was uh, about you know, the extent of my activism at that point, uh, you know, I was basically kind of a corporate clone uh, and was in hiding uh, and not out until uh, my lover, you know, literally, uh, you know, died on an airplane on his way to visit his sister. And I had to, uh, you know, leave um, uh, work and go retrieve the body. And did you have a, a history of activism before this? Uh, I had been in college in the late 60s. Uh, I had marched against the Vietnam War. I'd gotten involved with the feminist movement in the early 70s when I got out of college, uh, but I'd never been arrested before. But I, you know, marching in the street, that's what attracted me to ACT UP originally was that it was people out in the streets. Uh, And I thought, oh boy, right back to uh, my anti-war and uh, feminist days. And was it you who told me once about that the advice you got about being arrested was to have a bologna sandwich with you? No, that is my <laughs> advice. And the advice is <laughs> have a advice. peanut butter sandwich with you. Bologna. <laughs> they give you bologna in jail. You don't need to take it. And it's all green and, and rotten. <laughs> my advice is if you're going to be arrested, have a peanut butter sandwich or whatever and a paperback book to read. That was, I guess I'm remembering from when I interviewed you originally for, for, for Making Gay History 30, 30 years ago. So mm-hmm. I got the sandwich part, but I missed the, the, what was supposed to go between the bread. Yeah. Um, so Eric, what was the goal of this, this first protest on Wall Street? And I know Ken has some questions about, about, uh, about exactly how you decided what to do there, but what, what was the purpose? Well, the purpose was tr- to try to, uh, you know, draw attention uh, to the general public about the HIV crisis. You know, at that time, there was almost no mention uh, of AIDS whatsoever. And there was also uh, no research uh, going on uh, to try to find a cure or treatments for AIDS. And um, the pharmaceutical industry, all their stocks traded on Wall Street, uh, really weren't investing any of their own money into AIDS research because they thought they were too small a patient population. It wouldn't be cost productive for them. So we wanted to disrupt the trading of their stock on Wall Street with a message of no more businesses in in usual, stop killing us. Uh, You know, it's time to start developing uh, drugs to save our lives. Uh, it also was a wake-up call to the media uh, to try to, you know, get their attention uh, for them to, you know, talk openly about uh, AIDS, about how many people uh, were getting ill and dying, and about the fact that the government and the drug companies were not doing anything uh, to try to find a cure, uh, and that that was inhumane. And, you know, and Eric and Anne, you could both contextualize it in that I mean, it's very different to understand that you were, I I mean, there was GMHC and there may have been some support groups that that, there was no real dialogue going on amongst individuals about what was going, you know, what was happening, um, which is just amazing considering today with texting and so forth. But what happened from the center meeting to the 24th and what, how did you decide on that specific location at that time and how many people were there and how did you publicize it? 
I mean, it was a very sophisticated event just by seeing what was going on by that video. Well, there were a lot of the leadership of, of the, you know, the gay community uh, there. Uh, you know, Roger McFarlane was there, um, uh, who had been the first executive director of uh, GMHC and, and Larry and um, uh, uh, Vivian Shapiro, who was uh, one of the bo board chairs of the Human Rights Campaign Fund, uh, you know, pe people from the um, Gay and Lesbian Alliance. Uh, so some people who, you know, knew about organizing uh, and, uh, the, the first, you know, planning was done in Larry's apartment and, uh, you know, all of those people came uh, and Larry and uh, uh, Tim Sweeney and Roger McFarlane and others had been talking uh, about what they could do. And um, they had pretty much decided that Wall Street should be the target given the lack of funding and research going on uh, for the drug companies. And that, you know, they would also uh, be trying to ha um, highlight the fact that the US government was not spending uh, any of the money that had been allocated for AIDS research uh, because of a hiring freeze at the National Institute of Health that would not allow any researchers uh, to be hired to oversee clinical trials for the paltry amount that the Reagan administration uh, had allocated uh, to do um, AIDS research. So, you know, we knew the Wa Wall Street uh, area. Um, Larry had been talking to Joseph Papp uh, and he had said that he would um, have his props department build a life-size uh, puppet uh, so that we could hang Frank Young, the commissioner of the FDA, uh, from the light pole uh, that was right in front of uh, Trinity Church. And so, the, you know, there were some of these ideas coming on and there had already been, uh, I think it was Roger McFarland had outreached to uh, the uh, mayor's, uh, not to the mayor's office, to the police department uh, and, um, you know, kind of pre-warned them that there was going to be a civil disobedience. And, and over the next few uh, days, uh, there was uh, back and forth and, you know, it was agreed upon that seven people could get arrested and, uh, you know, a press re release went out uh, alerting uh, the media. There were people uh, who knew people who, you know, wrote for the Times or the Daily News or the New York Post or the Village Voice. And, you know, everybody was working the phones uh, to try to turn the media out, as, as well as the local uh, TV stations. Uh, Larry had been on, on some shows uh, when he started GMHC. And um, in addition, uh, you know, from other organizing, uh, both for the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the, the civil rights movement, the idea of having a phone tree uh, and uh, asking everybody uh, who was uh, in touch with us or who we had informed about the meeting uh, to show up, but to also call 10 of their uh, closest friends uh, and keep calling friends until they could get 10 people uh, to come there with them. And that's what, you know, kind of turned out more than 300 people that uh, showed up for that demonstration. Eric, what was the result of the demonstration? It was, it was quite amazing. It was kind of the first time that uh, a health group, uh, let alone uh, a queer, an LGBT uh, health group and a uh, and a group of people living with AIDS and, and their supporters uh, had done a public uh, civil disobedience action about AIDS. Uh, and it was a really good hook. Um, the media picked up uh, the event, uh, you know, we timed it so that um, it would happen uh, in morning rush hour. Right, and we began it right as the Wall Street traders would be, you know, trailing from uh, the subway. Uh, that the 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 subway entrance is right there at Trinity Church uh, for a lot of the subway lines, um, and they, you know, would have to cross 
uh, Broadway to go down Wall Street to get in the stock exchange. So we got their attention. Uh, and the fact that we were there and it was a Wall Street also target, um, that really got the, uh, me the, you know, the media um, interested. Uh, and um, it stopped traffic, not only on Broadway, uh, uh, you know, which is a major thoroughfare down there, but also on Wall Street. Uh, and so we had, you know, traffic tied up. The, the police department had bought, brought a bus to, you know, arrest people. Uh, so that was all there. There was this, you know, hanging effigy of uh, Frank Young, which uh, uh, some of my friends uh, drove a, an extension ladder down in the back of my pickup truck. Uh, and hung the the puppet for us. Uh, so you know that was getting a lot of attention in the media. And you know the the morning uh, new local news uh, covered the you know the demonstration. It was a you know it went live. Uh, the noon uh, local media covered it. It continued uh, in the evening news, both lo both local uh, and national. And uh, it continued to generate press. Uh, in terms of print media, you know, for the entire next week. So it, you know, it really kind of launched uh, in a major way, uh, not only ACT UP uh, and ACT uh, AIDS activism, uh, but it also did, you know, one of the other goals, uh, which was uh, to draw media attention and to open a public discourse uh, on the AIDS crisis and the lack of uh, compassionate response by the government or drug companies. Anne, were you aware of the, of the protests in real time? I have to say, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't either. Um, that doesn't mean I didn't read about it at the time. Um, but I was there a year later for the first anniversary, which was very much like it, but bigger. What, what, was, that first, what was that first anniversary march like, Anne? Well, uh, it was at the same place. The idea was to uh, uh, repeat what had been done the year before to do on the same kinds of issues, drug companies, Wall Street, pharma profits, lack of research, all of that was still completely urgent. Uh, but this time there was a, a much huger crowd, I think, given what yes. Eric's describing about the first one and what I see. Uh, and there were 200 people plus arrested, uh, and including me, my first ever arrest. And what I found in that, because, you know, it's a little scary to think about your first arrest, but doing it with a group of people you know makes it infinitely easier. And that that's an enormous sign of privilege and a... Uh, an important point of all of this activism that coming together as a group, working together, everything Eric describes about all the work, the collaborative effort that went into that first demonstration is so crucially important to all of this. And it's what kept people energized and safe and um, propelled us forward was working together in a group. And so the getting arrested with 200 of your closest friends is, uh, is not a bad thing to do. In, in reading up on, on ACT UP today um, and reading about the structure of the organization, or I mean, there was structure, but it was not a, a hierarchical structure. It was more consensus-based. Um, how was it possible to pull off these, these major protests um, with the structure that, well, maybe perhaps Eric or Anne or both can explain how ACT UP was structured at the time. Well, Eric, why don't you start with how it started and was structured? Sure, well, you know, we decided that we did not want a hierarchical uh, organization and that we didn't want uh, any paid staff. The idea was that, you know, when GMHC, you know, became hierarchical and had a board of directors, you know, who could, uh, deny certain things from happening uh, and paid staff who could also shut things down, uh, you know, act up, I'm sorry, GMHC didn't uh, do what Larry had, had hoped that it would do in terms of being both political as well as trying to care for people and educate people. Uh, and so uh, it was decided 
no board of directors. Uh, it would be a, a flat, everyone had, you know, an equal voice, an equal vote, that it would be primarily uh, consensus or majority ruled, uh, that there would be, uh, you know, public meetings, uh, it became called the floor of ACT UP, where ideas would be pitched uh, by uh, when we decided to have specific uh, interests like housing or treatment or AIDS research, committees uh, were formed and committee meetings happened and committees would uh, propose particular actions to happen, they'd bring it to the floor, they'd pitch it to the whole group, it'd be discussed, and then there would be votes on which actions to take up, uh, which actions to spend money on, how much money could be spent on a particular action or activity. And there, there was also like a coordinating committee, uh, kind of a person elected from each of the committees to go to, you know, a meeting once a, a week to you know, kind of pre-hash out, you know, some of, or just to share information about what would be coming forward uh, during the weekly meeting, uh, mainly to form an agenda. And what was your interest? Did you have, did you join one of the committees or one of the affinity groups? I, I was certainly a member of affinity groups for actions as we went along, but my role ended up being to help facilitate those weekly general meetings. Uh, we would elect uh, a group of facilitators and then two at a time they would run the uh, weekly meetings and to me it was uh, sort of going back to my producer role because it was live uh, choreography of having these conversations and it took a lot of focus and attention to keep it from devolving into chaos because you had several hundred people every week coming together on Monday nights to hash all this out. And there were some, uh, you know, real disagreements and a, a lot of divas and a lot of uh, idiosyncratic people. I, when I first joined ACT UP at the, uh, like it was around March 1st of 88, uh, and I walked into the room, I realized immediately that these were my people because they were all cranky individualists and <laughs> every last one of them had opinions and was not shy about expressing them. And we encouraged that. We wanted everything hashed out. One thing I always found, and no one's disagreed with me yet, but I, I await that day. I thought that process of, of really open discussion uh, produced great decisions. And I would be hard pressed to identify a bad decision that ACT UP ever made uh, because of this process, because none of it was done uh, behind closed doors. Everybody was able to leap in and, and comment. And that made us uh, really think about things and really work through whatever issues there were. And I am so proud of ACT UP for operating in that way and also and this is no longer, I think, possible these days, but uh, there, the arguing or discussion was so free flowing. Uh, there were very few, people didn't take it personally. Uh, we set up front, no personal attacks, no crosstalk, no attacking each other, stick to the issues. Uh, but it was a very uh, uncensored conversation, and uh, I thought that worked just beautifully. I miss it. I think the, the stakes were so high then, too, um, because of the, the Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think the space itself, I mean, people know the center today. That space in the center where ACT UP met was not an air conditioned room. It was rather claustrophobic with that many people in there, which was also, I'm sure, a contributing factor to some of the <laughs> cantankerous conversations. Um, was, yes, was, although there were cantankerous people to begin with. But yes, I take your point. Was there a strategy of um, various actions that were developed and, you know, GAA, Gay Activist Alliance, Gay Liberation Front, you know, GAA is known for its zaps. Was there a direct link from the GAA zaps to the ACT UP zaps? And what was the strategy to, you know, target actions? I would say there was a direct link, not only from the GAA zaps to ACT UP, but 
much farther back to uh, feminist, uh, uh, feminists were doing those kinds of actions mm -hmm. too. Uh, there were certainly similar actions around the war in the civil rights movement, those demonstrations, those sit-ins, those everything. All of it is a long line of people building on each other and taking those kinds of uh, uh, lessons. And I'll never forget the night that uh, one guy stood up and act up and identified himself as having been the national secretary for SDS, uh, a straight man who was there. Uh, it was a very diverse crowd in ACT UP uh, and people were there because of the issues, because it was the front line of action at the time in the kinds of issues of um, uh, class and race and uh, sex and uh, certainly uh, sexuality. Uh, that really are a through line with all these movements. And it, so ACT UP attracted people who had been all over the place in these other movements uh, coming together with a lot of gay men with HIV who were not practiced at these uh, kinds of actions or issues. And all together, uh, it produced a beautiful stew or as we have often said, mosaic uh, that work together synergistically. And there were, there were, there actually were uh, an actions committee and a ZAP committee. And the ZAP uh, committee, you know, like some of the other organization, was something that could respond uh, quickly in, you know, kind of an urgent emergency issue. Uh, you know, like somebody getting evicted from their apartment or some store throwing out people with AIDS, and you know, like a, a posse of an affinity group of people would, you know, basically go off the floor sometimes, you know, during a meeting and come back with a strategy that it would present at that, uh, you know, very meeting of how they were going to get that, you know, MF who had, you know, wronged one of us or, or a person with AIDS and collect people, uh, you know, in, in a small uh, contained group to go uh, deal with that emergency situations. Actions were much longer term uh, that would tend to uh, be planned over a period of a, a few weeks, or maybe if it's something huge like, you know, uh, storming the, the NIH, uh, you know, would be planned over a few months. Uh, but those strategies were very much, uh, you know, gleamed from civil rights, the war movement, the the, um, the uh, anti nukes movement, the women's movement. And then there was then there was the night that Larry stood up on a chair uh, when Dinkins had uh, chosen a new health commissioner from Indiana, who we hated because he talked about locking up people with HIV. And uh, Larry just stood up on a chair and said, we have to go to uh, Gracie Mansion right now. And we did. So, and the, 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 some of the protests were very high profile protests at, at locations that we can find on the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project like St. Patrick's Cathedral. What went in, because that's, that's the, the protest I know, you, I, I know about most famously because of your involvement. Um, how did you come to decide uh, that St. Patrick should be a target? Well, first, since you've mentioned landmarks, I'm going to take a slight detour and say to Ken, uh, is 100 Center Street on the landmarks of LGBT history? Because we spent more time there being prosecuted. Uh, and That's a good point. It will be added. It's on our database, but for other reasons. So. <laughs> Definitely belongs uh, as the landmark. It was my second home for a long time. Uh, I'm sorry, how did we choose St. Patrick's as a target? Yes, how did, yes, because I mean, I, just objectively, it's a, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a high profile target and it's also one that's freighted for all kinds of reasons. Sure, well, we were pissed. Uh, the Archdiocese of New York had a seat on the uh, Board of Education's AIDS Advisory Council, which meant the Catholic Archdiocese had a big voice in what public school children in New York City were being taught about AIDS, about sexuality, all of it. And we were furious about that. Uh, we could hardly think of anything worse. So we wanted to go after them. And so there was a proposal to do something against uh, the church 
and we started talking about an action. Uh, Eric talks about some actions having taken months to plan. I don't think there was any action that took longer and involved more internal debate in the group than going after uh, Cardinal O'Connor and St. Patrick's Cathedral. We almost came to blows over it. People were so upset within ACT UP. Uh, it was tremendously controversial. So, uh, Eric, I wonder what Eric thought. What did you think of the, of, of the idea? I, I thought it was really good. Uh, you know, Cardinal jo John O'Connor was a bully and, uh, you know, he hid behind, uh, you know, his, his dresses and his, big pointy hat uh, and, you know, his supposed religious uh, uh, bishopness, uh, if that's a word, uh, but he was literally preventing uh, life-saving information from going to the uh, New York public high schools. He was forbidding uh, school guidance counselors or nurses or health people to distribute condoms. Uh, there could be no instruction that talked about uh, same-sex uh, relations or or sexuality, and so you know, basically, young teenage, uh, you know, gay men who were most at risk uh, as being gay men uh, for contracting HIV uh, were being kept completely in the dark about you know interventions like the use of condoms that could prevent them from you know getting what was clearly a fatal illness. Uh, at that time, uh, because drugs hadn't yet been de developed. And we were furious that um, he was not uh, honoring the separation of church and state and was interfering with the uh, administration of a state activity, public education. Uh, and there was all of this, uh, you know, talk about how we couldn't invade the sanctity, you know, of the church. And we were like, screw that, you know, he's in, you know, invading uh, and not honoring the separation of uh, church and state. And, and as a result, young people are being infected with a fatal disease, uh, you know, uh, get him. <laughs> and, and so we did. And, uh, and that work of his to prevent that education also then continued the stigma. So uh, as well as preventing uh, the distribution of life-saving uh, information or devices, he was just promoting the stigma against uh, homosexuality, uh, against people with HIV. Uh, we also had a coalition going with the Women's Health Act Action Mobilization, WHAM, uh, I may get a word or two there wrong, but uh, be, who are very concerned about these same issues with reproductive uh, freedom, because of course the church was uh, interfering in that. Uh, so it, but it was a huge debate within ACT UP and it took us months to decide to do it. So, so Eric and Anne, can you take us inside St. Pat's that day? I um. can. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, we always, aside from a few private zaps, we always publicized our actions. So they knew we were coming. We had posters all over town. Stop the church was the name of the action. We had a lot of really provocative images of O'Connor, uh, choose your uh, local scumbag and a picture of O'Connor <laughs> and a picture of an unrolled condom. Uh, we had him done up in clown makeup with a big clown across his uh, face. Uh, so everyone knew this was going to happen. So we get there. It's a Sunday morning. We're going to uh, go there for mass on Sunday morning. Uh, it, it was freezing cold, which was one reason I decided to go inside rather than staying outside. Uh, there were about 5,000 people outside in the streets for the demo. Uh, there's a wonderful movie by Robert Hilferty, uh, a documentary about all of this called Stop the Church. Highly, highly, highly recommended. We'll explain all of this to you. But about 200 of us were going inside. We get there, the church is closed. They are they have police dogs sweeping the inside of the church uh, because they think we put bombs in there. Uh, I am going with Peter Staley as my date. We're imitating a heterosexual couple. We're all dressed nicely for church. We are wedged up against the door, the closed door of the church with 
the Operation Rescue people from Buffalo who have come down to defend the church. <laughs> that was scary, listening to them talk about what they were going to do to us. We get inside, we see all these plainclothesmen uh, around, uh, and then the mayor comes in, uh, the police chief comes in, they're sitting at the uh, police commissioner in the front row to defend the church, and we're scattered among the pews. Now, we have very clear, deliberate plans of what we're going to do. We're not going to interrupt anything religious. We're only going to do something in the midst of the homily. We're going to be very calm and collected and respectful. And, you know, this group's going to do this and this group's going to do that. We're going to lie in the middle aisle as nuns did protesting the church years before. Uh, some people are going to stand and read a statement. All very well planned uh, to be appropriate in invading the cathedral. The Cardinal gets up, he's very shaky, uh, uh, warning people that something's gonna happen. And then we get to the homily, we start to make our move and Michael Petrellis gets up on a pew and stands on a pew and starts screaming at the Cardinal, you're a murderer, you're a murderer, you're a murderer. <laughs> Stop and killing us. Them. Stop killing us. Was that was that part of the plan? No. Oh. In <laughs> fact, we had told him not to come and not to do anything, but he did. And uh, and really, I thought I was going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lying in the center aisle with, a, you know, a lot of other people and the parishioners were going nuts and throwing things at us and attacking people. Uh, uh, the cops were coming and it was just utter, utter chaos and very, very scary. And the, uh, the altar boys were walking among us, dropping little leaflets on us uh, in defense of the church. And, uh, and the cops were coming in and arresting us. And uh, I had, had carrying us out on orange stretchers. I happened to be the last one carried out. And by that time, things had calmed down and it was quiet. And I just started chanting, we're fighting for your lives too. We're fighting for your lives too. And that was echoing off the ceiling. I thought it was very effective, but evidently not. Mm -hmm. So then uh, after we'd all been carried out, they resumed the mass uh, and some of our people were still inside. And Tom Keene went up to take uh, communion and he planned to take communion. He hadn't planned anything ahead of time, but he was so upset when he got up there and so just distraught at the whole uh, event of the issues and everything else that when he was given the wafer, he just spontaneously crumbled it and dropped it to the floor. And that became worldwide headlines. That became the big issue of the invasion of the cathedral the destruction of the communal wafer. Uh, so I remember, I remember vividly um, the headlines and hearing about that. The focus was on the wafer. All uh, over the world, yeah. worldwide coverage of this, which made us very happy because that's <laughs> what we wanted. We wanted uh, coverage. And I, I, my proof of that is that uh, shortly thereafter, I was talking to Gabriel Rotello, another, another of our great members, who said that he'd been talking to his mother in Danbury, Connecticut, about the action, suburban housewife. She said, uh, you know, Gabriel, I've been talking to my friends about this, and we've decided that before this action, we thought gay men were weak and wimpy, but now we know they're strong and angry. <laughs> So you made your point. Yes. So I, I have a, a question that's come in from my young friend Nina, who is who is joining us from from Moscow. Um, she said she's interested. I'm interested how and when. And hi, Nina. It's so great to, to have you on this call. Um, how and when did ACT UP first come up with the idea of doing die-ins? Because that's what you were doing in the aisle at St. Patrick's. Am I correct? Yes. And we did them all over the place. Eric, do you have any? Well, that um, I think came out of the anti-war movement. And I mean, the very first uh, act up demonstration on Wall Street, uh, what the arrest scenario was, was a die-in in the middle of Broadway uh, at the base of um, 
of Wall Street. And so, you know, laying in the street, uh, disrupting traffic, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, the action that we took. Um, eventually later on, uh, and I, I don't know if this is, is something we came up with or if other people had done it, but um, when uh, victims of, uh, you know, automobile uh, accidents uh, that, that rendered fatalities or shootings in the street, um, often the, the crime scene, uh, they draw, uh, you know, an outline of the body where it laid during the police, um, uh, you know, investigation, you know, we started, you know, after a while picking that up too of, you know, tracing an outline of people uh, who were doing civil disobedience by doing this die-in in the street. And then if, if we did it either with paint or at least chalk, uh, it would um, be maintained and kind of live on for at least a few days if it was only chalk to you know draw attention that we were here and and had to die in there one of the questions that that's come in and also is indicative of where we are today and then what was the sort of diversity of, of act up uh, from its demographics and outreach. I mean, GMHC started out basically as a white cisgendered organization and then evolved. I mean, was there an interaction with other groups that um, to engage them with ACT UP's tactics and needs? Uh, there certainly were attempts uh, to diversify the group more. Um, because we met at the LGBT Center uh, in New York, in the West Village, uh, you know, which the West Village is a pretty privileged white uh, area. You know, the biggest diversity there is its presence of gay men and lesbians. Uh, we were pretty much a uh, white organization, but there uh, was a significant and a very important presence of, uh, you know, gay women there as well. Uh, you know, who like Anne, you know, were a really significant part of the leadership uh, of ACT UP. Uh, we, we tried a number of things, including not only reaching out to AIDS, the few AIDS organizations uh, that existed in Harlem and, and uh, in, in Brooklyn and other areas, uh, to invite them to meetings, to having some of our committee meetings and even a few, uh, you know, larger outreach uh, events in some of the churches, especially uh, in Harlem and 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 uh, other places, uh, but um, the response in terms of uh, black and brown people uh, wasn't uh, significant in terms of numbers. We did have a very um, active Latino caucus uh, that. I don't know, it was probably like 30, 40 people at a minimum who attended regularly, who um, provided leadership and organized, helped us organize lots of um, actions that were oriented towards and uh, highlighted issues in the Latino community. We also had a majority AIDS action committee uh, because a majority of people with AIDS in the US were, bl were black uh, that was, you know, led by you know some of our um, our our black uh, brothers and sisters, uh, but we never really were happy with the um, amount of diversity we were able to attract. And a, a lot of what we were told was that um, you know, especially black gay men didn't feel comfortable. Uh, going to the LGBT center in uh, Greenwich Village. But I, I, I really want to emphasize that we were a lot more diverse than people generally acknowledge. There were significant numbers of black members, Latino members, uh, straight members. Uh, in the end, I was uh, prosecuted as one of the St. Patrick's Six. Uh, we were me as a white lesbian, there was a white straight woman, there was a trans woman, there was a black gay man uh, and two white gay men. 
Uh, it, it was not a perfect uh, demographic representation by any means, but uh, there was a lot more diversity than I think people recognize. I wonder, looking back now, 34 years to that first demonstration, and then during your time being active in ACT UP, what do you think the legacy um, uh, is of those, certainly those early days of ACT UP? Uh, Anne, you wanna take it first and then Eric? Well, for me, it's uh, challenging uh, received wisdom, challenging people in power. To me, the attraction of ACT UP uh, was uh, to uh, adopt the analysis that people in power are perfectly happy to let everybody else die. Uh, they're into a system of attrition. Uh, so a grassroots organization that challenges that and is not afraid to go out and tell the truth and be provocative is, I think, a, a a fundamental necessity of society. Uh, and I'm glad we did what we did, but I despair at the extent to which people don't remember ACT UP, have no idea it existed. Uh, we repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. We are still today arguing about pharmaceutical company greed and the unwillingness of the US to force pharmaceutical companies to break their patents for poor countries to get people the COVID vaccine. It's exactly the kind of stuff we were doing back then. And it's extremely disheartening to me that we uh, never learn these lessons in any ongoing meaningful way. Eric? Well, I, I think ACT UP uh, did definitely have an impact, um, not in, only in terms of healthcare and HIV care uh, and, and AIDS research, but also social justice and uh, you know, health equity. Uh, Anthony Fauci uh, you know, said uh, on the event of Larry Kramer's death, uh, and he's repeated it other times uh, before that, that in his mind, uh, healthcare is marked uh, in terms of pre Larry Kramer and post Larry Kramer. And that, uh, you know, Larry Kramer and ACT UP's, uh, you know, insistence that, uh, you know, nothing for us without us, that, you know, an affected community uh, uh, of a disease group had to have a seat at a table and have a major voice uh, in. Uh, the developments of treatment and care and support uh, for that community. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, ACT UP is credited for is changing the way a, a drug research is done in this country. Uh, at, you know, before ACT UP, it was 10 to 15 years for a new drug to be developed. There were huge um, uh, clinical trials, three different phases that required at least 10,000 or more people in each phase that would go on for years and years uh, that, you know, that would take it five years in each phase that would, you know, make it last at least 10, 12, uh, if not 15 years before a new drug was developed. We insisted that uh, the U.S. adopt uh, a system similar to what was done in, in Europe and other developed countries uh, where there were shorter term uh, clinical trials um, phases and a shorter number of patients and that drugs also be made available uh, even prior to a final decision through a compassionate use basis uh, if there was a drug that looked promising and could possibly save someone's life uh, who would be dead in uh, six months or less. And so, you know, a major impact on R&D. Uh, we also did a lot to change the safety net, how uh, people get access to Medicare, food stamps, housing placements, housing allowances, transportation al allowances. Uh, we, we helped um, structure and demand a division of aid services uh, be established that gave one-stop shopping and one application process to all those benefits for people living with AIDS. That had never been done before. That system, uh, the HIV AIDS administration, uh, still exists today, uh, providing coordinated care uh, for, for folks like that. Um, I helped start Housing Works also that, you know, formed many models and, and did a lot to 
develop uh, how housing is done for people with AIDS that's been replicated for other uh, illnesses. And similarly, um, I, I helped with other people start a group called Health Gap that did work to uh, force patent uh, restrictions from being lifted for the generic production of AIDS drugs for free um, distribution uh, in the developing world. And, and things like the Global Fund for HIV TB and the PEPFAR program came out of uh, the activism of uh, the AIDS community. So um, we really did have a pretty big impact on how in the, in the case of you know free drugs for Africa, that's not only a global public health, but it's also a global development initiative. And I'm quite proud of what ACT UP accomplished. I, I think you know, a question came in about Queer Nation. I think ACT UP also motivated others in social justice for queer issues to get much more visible as, you know, as GLF and GAA came out of Mattachine, these groups were much more visible and um, act active on the streets. I'm sorry. Anna. Yes, and I, well, first I wanna say, I think it was, it was uh, the height of surrealism to see Donald Trump talking about uh, compassionate use in, <laughs> when we started talking about COVID, uh, but in fact he did and I was having flashbacks. Uh, but yes, I think uh, the patient empowerment movement, absolutely. And uh, more broadly, self-respect uh, for LGBT people. Uh, the idea of standing up and demanding what we wanted and needed is something that did propel the movement forward. And uh, I do think everything that's come since has been uh, seeded by ACT UP. I agree, Anne. I, I think that you know we demanded and seized a seat at the table, and I, I think you know through our action, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I think we created a you know political power for the LGBT community that didn't exist prior. Could you talk about where ACT UP is today? Because I still I know that they still meet at the center. Uh, ACT UP exists, ACT UP is active. It's certainly not as big as it was in those days, uh, but it's very much active and working on issues uh, uh, locally, state issues here in New York a lot, national issues, uh, very much a presence. Very much kind of the drivers of the prep for all uh, access initiative to you know ensure that people of all, uh, you know, diversity and, uh, and um, you know, economic backgrounds have access to PrEP to prevent HIV infection and not just for gay men, uh, but also, you know, anyone at risk, drug users, uh, women, uh, especially, uh, uh, you know, both cis and trans women uh, of color uh, who don't have access to healthcare. Eric, do you have any more questions? No, I'm just, I'm watching the clock. We're at 7.30, so yeah. I'm going to turn it back to you. Well, I was looking at the clock as well, just in conscious of everyone's time. Um, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Eric Marcus. Um, you know, as someone who's been looking at LGBT history and wishing that there were interviews like this with people who did actions in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s. This is marvelous as a document. Um, and it's also marvelous to be able to thank you directly with what you have done and what you've seeded um, and enabling opportunities for so many others. And Eric, thank you for hosting this and being the MC. Um, and thank well, you for the 80 plus participants that were here throughout this event tonight. And I think it's really indicative of what ACT UP's legacy is and what ACT UP means and how it's inf affected all of us today. So thank you. Can I thank give you, Ken. Thank yeah. you, Eric and Eric. And thank you everyone whose faces I see, some of whom I know very well, others I don't, but great to see you all here. And believe me, all this activism has been a great gift uh, to me personally. I'm thrilled to have uh, participated in it. 
Thank, thank you for organizing this. And if I can give a commercial plug, <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt. It's a David Wanarovich Burning Man issue, uh, which is the fundraiser for the New York City AIDS Memorial. Uh, you can go to newyorkcityagesmemorial.org uh, and buy this t-shirt to support the, the AIDS Memorial in New York City, which exists to pay tribute to the more than 100,000 people uh, who died of AIDS in New York City alone. And on a more mundane uh, note, uh, I'm working with Reclaim Pride on the third annual Queer Liberation March, which will be June 27th out in the streets while the hop people are sitting at home. And uh, we invite you to join us. Go to reclaimprideNYC.org for more information. And lastly, uh, last commercial, we're having an event on May 25th with Jonathan Ned Katz on the daring life of Eve Adams, who was a Jewish immigrant from Poland who um, had a tea room in the village uh, for two years, but had a remarkable life and was deported from this country for being a lesbian and writing indecent poetry and eventually wound up being murdered at Auschwitz. And Jonathan's book is incredible. So I suggest joining us to hear it live from Jonathan's mouth. Thanks. Thanks everybody, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Bye. Bye.